I'm Dan Mogilov from the UC Berkeley Office of Public Affairs, and today it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Berkeley's next chancellor, Professor Nicholas Dirks. Professor Dirks is currently at Columbia University, where he teaches in the departments of history and anthropology. In addition, he serves as the executive vice president of arts and sciences, and also as the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences. Professor Dirks, welcome. Thank you, Dan. Great to talk to you. So tell me, how does it feel to be introduced as Berkeley's next chancellor. I am deeply honored by the uh, opportunity to serve in this leadership capacity for such a great university. Uh, Berkeley has been one of the great institutions of higher learning ever since it was established over 100 years ago. And to have the chancellorship of that great university now attached to my name, still, of course, in a designate role, uh, is just a, a huge honor for me. Professor Dirks, you've had a long, distinguished career in academia, starting at the California Institute of Technology in 1978, from there on to Michigan, arriving in Columbia in 1997. Talk to me a little bit about what you've picked up along the way that's prepared you to become the next chancellor of UC Berkeley. Well, one of the great things about being at Caltech was the opportunity to interact with some of the great minds of science. I was able to get to know Marie Galman, Richard Feynman, Max Delbruck, and indeed, uh, scores of scholars in the sciences, from engineering to theoretical physics, whose work clearly was at the cutting edge of some of the most important issues in 20th century science. It was a, a wonderful 10-year period of, uh, of my life. Going to Michigan, though, was going into a much larger domain of higher education, of public higher education. It was a time not just of great exploration in interdisciplinary social science, but it was also an opportunity to learn about how a great public research institution can both provide the very best kind of education, and indeed the very best kinds of resources for faculty to engage in research, but also have a direct public mission and a sense that what it was doing as a, as a university uh, spoke to the needs of both the local uh, community the state at large, and indeed the nation in an even larger sense. And I learned uh, a great deal about the kinds of opportunities that were available uh, in a great public university. At the same time, when I got a call to come to Columbia, and this was in 1996, I moved there in 1997, I couldn't say no. I was being asked to go and chair the first Department of Anthropology in the United States, a department that had been established by Franz Boas in 1896, and a department that was absolutely foundational uh, for the importance of anthropology in the United States uh, throughout the 20th century. So it sounds just listening to you that the academic culture, that environment, is something that you, you deeply love and deeply connected to. It, it, there's a lot of passion in when I hear you talk about that. I think that the university in some ways is the last great utopian institution that we have in our society. And one of the reasons that I've enjoyed doing all the things that I've done, whether chairing a department, setting up a program, working with students in some kind of new way, or for that matter, becoming the executive vice president of the arts and sciences at Columbia, has given me an opportunity to try to engage at every level, both the challenges, but the enormous opportunities that these institutions, these great institutions of both teaching and research, uh, have afforded uh, so many people in our, in our society. You brought up the one of the positions you hold at Columbia, Executive Vice President of Arts and Sciences. In addition, you're also the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Neither of those positions have an exact corollary at UC Berkeley. So talk to me a little bit about what exactly your responsibilities are, what you're involved in, what your day job looks like. Well, it is a job that I think doesn't exist at any other institution, private or public. And the Arts and Sciences was created effectively as a separate entity within the university at large. The Arts and Sciences consists of Columbia College, of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, of the School of General Studies, of the uh, School of the Arts, the School of International and Public Affairs, and most recently, the School for Continuing Education. So it's had six schools. I therefore, as Executive Vice President, have six deans who report to me. I also have 28 departments with 28 chairs, around 35 institutes and centers uh, that range across from nanoscience to the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies. It's an enormous range, uh, an enormous job, but it comes along effectively with the kind of responsibility for this unit that as it's organized at Columbia is a separate financial as well as educational unit. Mm. So the budget now is roughly $650 million. 
and it's our responsibility in my office uh, to make sure that we balance that budget, but that we also manage to do as much uh, and realize as many of the aspirations of the university at large uh, with the resources that we have on hand. So you've had, sounds like, this wonderful preparation for where you're now headed, California Hall. So talk to me a little bit about where do you want to lead Berkeley? Well, it's a very exciting thing to think about, first of all. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be uh, uh, and to be contemplating this move across the country to uh, California and to California Hall. And one of the things that struck me when I first started reading about the University of California at Berkeley and this opportunity was the extent to which these two goals of the university for excellence and access were organized in a way that did not put them as competing priorities, but made them in fact rough, the, the, same, uh, the same aspiration for the university from start to finish. We all know about the excellence of Berkeley, but it also is a university that by virtue of its being public, by virtue of recent decisions that have, in, that have stressed diversity, uh, that have built in the middle class access program, that have uh, absolutely uh, took on board the need to, have as, to recruit as many Pell Grant students as possible, has a public mission that is completely in concert with its research and scholarly excellence. So the first thing I want to do is help to celebrate and preserve those aspirations and to be as committed as I possibly can to advancing both the excellence and the commitment to access that is part of the DNA of the University of California at Berkeley. Of course, there are lots of things to be done. On the one hand, I think that the new ventures that I've been reading about and talking to new colleagues about are extremely exciting. The Blum Center for Developing Economies is one of them. The new initiative in nanoscience, actually uh, something that we've been working on very hard at Columbia, but which Berkeley is doing great things in. The new uh, grant for and initiative in big data. And of course, the, uh, the new uh, support for computing science. And these are just a few of the many things that are taking place and a few of the many things that I would like to be able to help provide additional resources for. So I join with the people of this state to celebrate what the University of California is, but also to commit myself, not just to pre preserving the university and all of its excellence, but also in trying to find new ways to make the university relevant to the kinds of problems we face as a society. So traditionally, the chancellor at Berkeley by virtue of his office and the position that he holds in the context of American higher education, has been a powerful and prominent voice for public education. Is that something that you look forward to taking advantage of? And have you thought about what kind of messages you want to convey and how you want to use that access to the public? This is one of the great attractions of this role. And I can think of few roles in higher education that actually afford the same level of authority but also of responsibility to make clear how important the investment, not just of states, but indeed of the general public in the future of higher education in America is. This is a time we all know when there are lots of questions being asked. Tuition goes up both in privates and in publics. Cost of higher education, of course, seems to be exploding far faster than any other costs at a time when inflation is so low and unemployment so high. And there are many questions that are being asked about even the character of the education that we offer our students. Recent studies have questioned whether students learn as much as we claim when they take a liberal arts education. And I look forward to the opportunity to use this position to not just explain what it is the university does, but to ensure that we do the kinds of things that are necessary in order to persuade our publics that this kind of investment is not just necessary, but important for them and important indeed for a much broader cross-section than the actual people who simply participate in the education that we provide. So for me, this opportunity, which has so many uh, exciting components, uh, I think uh, has, best of all, uh, an opportunity to preach about what I care most about, and that is the importance, not just of education, but of this kind of excellence in education for the public good. When the search process got underway for the next chancellor, for Berkeley's next chancellor, 
We had open forums on campus, places where students, faculty, staff, alumni could come and express opinions about what they hoped to see. And one of the things that we heard from students a lot was they wanted to know how candidates had in their professional past demonstrated respect for students and for their perspectives. And I'm wondering if there's a broader philosophy that will inform your approach to students and their perspectives when you become Berkeley's chancellor. Well, I would always hope that whatever I do, I can convey the sense of deep respect I have for the kinds of issues that make students feel so engaged and so passionate. I am always uh, struck by the extent to which students, when they get interested in these kinds of issues and when they become active, are taking seriously the ideas and the talk that we uh, engage in about values and about uh, truth and about justice and about uh, all the big issues that are part of our liberal arts curriculum, uh, that they're taking these things seriously in their, in their lives as students. Uh, I also know that as students confront issues that uh, are important in their own personal and political lives, they are uh, trying to uh, ensure that the institution that they're attending, the institution that they're identified with, the institution that will be part of their affiliation for the rest of their lives, takes them seriously as they engage in these kinds of issues. So for me, in part, it's about walking the walk. It's about mm. taking seriously what we teach in the classroom and taking on the responsibilities that we as administrators have to engage students about the things they care deeply about. At Columbia, we've had serious controversies around issues having to do not just with Middle East politics, but in fact with the teaching of Middle East studies. And so the first and most important thing that I bring to these kinds of occasions is the need to accord every participant the maximum respect possible. But then, of course, to try to find ways to establish the grounds of dialogue at the same time that we always are seeking to make sure that students feel safe, that they feel that they aren't being personally attacked, they feel they aren't being attacked on the basis of their religion or their ethnicity, their identity in any uh, form uh, it might be relevant. And so the first thing that we need to do is to make respect the foundation of the way we engage issues, whether with faculty or with staff, and most of all with students. And I hope that my commitment to dialogue, to negotiation, to talking with students, and indeed to openness about everything that we do, will perhaps uh, be helpful uh, in, a situa in situations at, at, at Berkeley where there are sometimes passions and even tempers that can, uh, can grow out of pace. Uh, with the needs that we have as an institution to bring communities together and resolve our uh, dif differences and our disagreements in an amicable way. You just brought up the Middle East and the extent to which it's been a source of controversy and some confrontation and conflict in Colombia. The same has been true to some extent at Berkeley. It's obviously an issue that people feel very strongly about. So I want to come right at another issue. Um, floating around on the internet is a, is a claim that at some point in your past, you, know, you signed a petition calling for Columbia to divest in all things Israel. And I want to give you an opportunity to sort of let us know exactly what happened there mm -hmm. and what your role was and what your sort of philosophy is about sort of divestment type efforts insofar as the Middle East or any other place in the world is right. concerned. Well, when that um, particular petition was being circulated, I was chair of the Department of Anthropology and in fact at some point saw my name on a list and asked it to be removed. The truth is I do not support uh, divestment as a strategy for the university. I don't support divestment uh, with respect to Israel. At the same time, many of my colleagues felt very strongly about this, and many of them signed a petition. And it circulated widely at the time, uh, which was 2002. And there were, after that, all sorts of other controversies that developed about the climate for Jewish students on Columbia's campus about the nature of instruction in the Department of Middle East Studies, and indeed about the atmosphere at Columbia more generally. We felt that we needed to make very clear that we were committed to a classroom environment in which students felt that they could think anything they wanted to think about political issues that might come up uh, in their instruction. We have students from all kinds of backgrounds for whom we have to be deeply concerned about their experience mm -hmm. on campus. 
We've had students who have been concerned, for example, about the fact that as Muslims, they haven't had open access to prayer rooms for the kind of uh, uh, regular daily prayer that is part of their religious observance. So the question of respect that you asked me about before is a question that has to run deep uh, in terms of our relationships with students from all backgrounds. And we have to be attentive also to the larger context within which the kinds of things that students experience sometimes get magnified on a college campus where there are pressures, obviously, on some communities more than on others and some groups more than others. So we've worked very hard to be as open as we could possibly be and as responsive as we could be. I talked to a number of students last week. He said, you know, what should I ask the new guy about? And I was struck by how many said, ask where he stands on diversity. How do you think about diversity in the context of a college campus? Well, I think in the first instance, uh, the diversity of people is probably the most important thing. One of the great things about many American universities, certainly the University of California and indisputably the University of California at Berkeley, is the mix of people who are there as students, as staff, as faculty, and indeed the mix that's represented in the vast alumni body of the university. And it's that mix that works to ensure the kind of open debate and the kind of encounters with difference that are absolutely fundamental to the kind of education that we seek to impart in our universities and indeed at, at Berkeley. Having said that, I think diversity is important at every level. And it's something about which one can never actually say, OK, we've done this. We've had a diversity initiative. We have these statistics in terms of our student body. We have this kind of representation in terms of our faculty and think that's enough. It's not. At Columbia, we have engaged in a number of different diversity initiatives. We now have more students of color than any other institution in the Ivy League, and we have more underrepresented minorities. We did so uh, in terms of the faculty. Uh, after 2004, when I began my role as executive vice president, the president and the provost and the trustees made available certain resources, and we were able, within three to four years, to double the number of underrepresented minorities on the faculty. We were able to increase dramatically the number of women in STEM fields. But we also know that as much progress as we made, we just started. One of the things I hope to be able to do is sponsor a continuous diversity initiative in relationship to faculty, in relationship to students, and in relationship to staff at University of California, Berkeley. So you just brought up staff. We've been talking about students for a while. What kind of, what's your leadership philosophy as a manager? What kind of manager are you? I think people would like to hear a little bit from you about what your approach and how you view the role that staff play at a, at a great research university like Berkeley or Columbia. Sure. Well, oftentimes, staff are the unsung heroes of the university. They're the ones who come to work every day. They don't get sabbaticals. Uh, they don't get uh, summer vacations. They show up day after day after day, and indeed, both at Berkeley and indeed at my institution, their uh, compensation has lagged far behind that of faculty and indeed oftentimes of, uh, of, of staff in other universities where there are more resources to go around. And this can create huge morale issues that combined with the recognition of the role that they play can undermine the fabric of, uh, of, 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 of the way in which staff approach their, their work in the university. At Columbia, it's been a, one of the great things about being in my job to get to know some of the staff who I used to just sort of see from a distance mm -hmm. and more or less take for granted. Staff in my office probably think that I'm a, a soft touch and uh, I don't want that to get out too uh, widely, but the truth is I love my interactions with, uh, with staff. And I realize how incredibly important it is that we make the university a place where the staff actually feel recognized and of course where they feel adequately rewarded for the unbelievably important work they do. You know, you referred to staff as unsung heroes, and I couldn't agree more, but there's another group, which are the sung heroes, if there is such an expression, and rightfully so, and that's the faculty at UC Berkeley. World class in every way. And one of the things I think, that one of the defining attributes of Berkeley is this idea of shared governance, that faculty should have a hand, a role, a voice, a meaningful voice and role in terms of the operations and management of the university. Is that something that sounds foreign to you coming from a, a private Ivy League institution? I know that many people will think so. And certainly uh, the kind of commitment that Berkeley has traditionally had to shared governance is something I think that the institution is rightly uh, proud of. 
That being said, a number of years ago, I was worried about a deficit of faculty governance at Columbia. Mm. And so I uh, drove a review and an evaluation of our faculty governance. I brought in an outside committee. The outside committee actually had somebody who had been very active in the Senate uh, at Berkeley, mm. along with some deans and others. Who was that? David Hollinger, a professor mm -hmm. of history, who I actually had the privilege of working with as a colleague in the history department at Michigan uh, mm -hmm. many years ago. But he, uh, along with his uh, colleagues on the review committee, made some recommendations that we took back to our faculty, that we worked with various committees to both uh, refine and develop, uh, and then which became the basis for a major reform of faculty governance at Columbia, which is now much more like Berkeley shared governance mm. than it was before. And I found it to be really transformative in the way in which my relationship with faculty is conducted on a regular basis and the way in which the business of our office has now become open to both the advice and the regular scrutiny of standing faculty committees who have the kind of data, the information, the context and background uh, to participate in the decisions uh, that we make. And it may sometimes for administrators seem a rocky experience, but it's absolutely critical. So as we take this tour through sort of the major stakeholder groups that a university has, students, staff, faculty, there's obviously one more extremely important group, and that's alumni. Indeed. Um, and particularly now for Berkeley, where we rely to a greater extent than we ever have on philanthropy, building and sustaining those ties that bind alumni to the campus has become even more important. Talk to me a little bit about your own engagement with that stakeholder group at Columbia, and how you see alumni in the context of the broader campus community in terms of roles and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, one of the things that I have also enjoyed about the role that I've been playing at Columbia has been the extent to which I've gotten to know alumni who care deeply about what we do at Columbia. They've been thrilled to be participants of the university, and they have shown this uh, sense of investment, literally, by sometimes supporting, uh, providing resources for new kinds of programs, for financial aid, for other things that we do in ways that have been unprecedented. And I've also recognized the extent to which this community of alumni help us think through some of the things that we could do better as an institution. It's been really, I think, very eye-opening for somebody who came out of the faculty to go into administration to realize that we have partners across the alumni base that are absolutely critical to our capacity to do the things that we hope to do and even to develop a better sense of what we hope to do. So I look forward, uh, as I come to the University of California at Berkeley, to get to know uh, as many alumni as possible, to having as much of an opportunity as possible to connect with different alumni groups, to hear from different alumni voices, to have the opportunity to recruit alumni to a sense of greater participation in the institution, to help us think through the challenges that we face. I don't think there is a chief executive in higher education that doesn't have to get involved in fundraising. And obviously the same, that holds true for the chancellor at UC Berkeley. Is that something that you see as sort of a task that will have to be tolerated? Or do you have a different perspective on that key role that chancellors have played at Berkeley as well as presidents at institutions across the country? We started at Columbia a capital campaign in 2004 in its silent phase and then went uh, public and uh, noisy in 2006. And in this campaign, we have had unprecedented success in raising funds across the institution. We started off with a target, again, one of the highest targets in the history of American higher education of $4 billion. We're now closing in on $6 billion. And I've learned during this whole process that fundraising is an extraordinary opportunity to connect with people and provide opportunities for them to support things about which we share a deep and common commitment. Fundraising is not like getting on the telephone and calling people and disturbing them from dinner and saying, you know, will you give something and being hung up on. Fundraising is about a relationship. It's about a relationship with a common commitment to an institution. I'm struck in our discussion about the extent to which really important values and principles such as diversity and equality and engagement, participation, equity, access, they're, they're right there for you. They seem to have informed so much of what you do and what you've done. Where does it all come from? Well, you know, I'm going to revert to my parents because I think they played a very big role in shaping me as somebody for whom these are commitments that have been part of my life ever since I really remember uh, having a public position on anything. You know, my father 
was the son of immigrant, uh, immigrant uh, Germans who came to this country, homesteaded land in central Iowa. Mm -hmm. He grew up on a farm, uh, unable to speak English until he went to school, and he only left the farm because he had a very bad heart, which meant that he couldn't be a farmer. He went to college to become a minister. It was the only thing that was understood as a possible thing to do outside of farming at that time. He went to college, he went to seminary, he went to graduate school, he taught for many years at the L Divinity School. And while he was teaching theology, he took me periodically to Battelle Chapel at Yale while I listened to the sermons of a William Sloan Coffin, uh, who had just returned from Selma, Alabama, who was reflecting the, both uh, uh, the, the issues of the day, but who himself uh, was deeply committed to questions of social equality, to uh, the end of racial discri discrimination, to the kinds of questions that, of course, he addressed throughout his long career. And I, I, felt, uh, I, I felt deeply influenced by both my father, by, uh, uh, by Coffin, uh, and of course, at the same time, by the fact that my mother, who was teaching in a high school and had uh, a much less public life in that, re in that respect, uh, was herself uh, somebody who, in her everyday life, teaching in inner city schools in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, teaching home economics uh, to young girls at a time when home economics was still taught in schools, but with an eye towards thinking about their futures as she thought about her own, as moving beyond the traditional relationships of, uh, of gendered uh, stereotype. Uh, all of that uh, together, uh, I think, probably made me the person I am, and I will take this opportunity to thank my parents for anything I do that's right. So now we're going to venture into uh, up close and personal territory, if you will. We've been talking mostly about your professional life, past and present. Tell us a little bit about your family, about uh, the rest of the picture, if you will. Well, my wife, Janaki Bakle, is uh, an associate professor of history at Columbia. She grew up in, in Bombay and uh, went to college also in, in Bombay at Alphaston College. Came to the United States first to do a graduate career at Temple University, then had a career, in fact, in academic publishing before returning to graduate school and uh, starting her new career as a historian of, of South Asia. Uh, we have a son who is 13 years old. He's been wearing for the last several days uh, only sweatshirts and sweatpants and t-shirts that emblazon cowl on them. Uh, he's a six-footer, and uh, I've heard that Sandy Barber is already tracking him as a potential recruit for basketball. I also have a daughter uh, from uh, my first marriage. She was a graduate of Mills College and then came to Columbia where she did a degree at the Columbia Journalism School and she now works for Iowa Public Radio and can be heard periodically on All Things Considered and Morning Edition as she's been in Iowa covering recent events with uh, a certain kind of bird's eye view that has been unique and wonderful for her. Sounds like family is something really important for you. Well, of course it is. And uh, one of the things about these jobs is you don't get a lot of off time. So it's been very important to be able to carve out some time and space where I can simply hang with my son, talk with my daughter, and be with my wife. Uh, we have uh, cherished weekends together where we've gone hiking and uh, walking and biking and sometimes boating. Uh, but most of all, where we've simply been together, cooking, watching football sometimes, uh, but always just being sustained by each other's company and love and support. What else do you like to do for fun? There's a rumor going around you're a bit of a fitness fanatic? I don't know how these rumors get started, <laughs> but it is true that uh, the athletic director at Columbia, Diane Murphy, wonderful, wonderful colleague, has uh, made sure over the eight years that I've been in my job that whenever I need to use elliptical number one on the top floor, it's reserved in my name. No, I do like to go to the gym on a regular basis. I used to like to run until I had to get a new ACL. Uh, but even so, I uh, will become a regular member of the Berkeley gym. You talked about your own participation in sports, and it sort of reminds me that you're going to have to do some shape shifting in the months ahead, moving from a, being a Columbia Lion to being a California Golden Bear. And I do know that Columbia has a large and robust uh, intercollegiate athletics program, and obviously so does Cal. What are your thoughts about the appropriate role of an intercollegiate athletics program at a university like Columbia or Berkeley and the benefits, both tangible and intangible, that accrue to an institution as a result of the presence of that sort of program? 
Yeah. You know, it turns out that Columbia has as many uh, intercollegiate sports teams that it supports as, as, as the University of California and Berkeley 29. It's exactly the same number. Uh, and it turns out, of course, that while Columbia has not always been as good in some rather public uh, sports uh, as, uh, as some of its peers, uh, it's had a very robust sports program across the board. And it's been very important as part of the student experience at Columbia and indeed as part of the whole alumni experience. We believe at Columbia, and I'm sure that I will join many colleagues who will believe with me at the University of California at Berkeley that if you're going to do something, you do it well. And if you do something in an excellent university that has the kind of distinction that Berkeley has in areas ranging from science to law, that you also aspire to excellence in your athletic programs. That is not to say that you do things that would in any way compromise the academic integrity of the programs, or for that matter, put athletics above academics. But I look forward to joining my new colleagues and uh, alumni and students uh, uh, with as much enthusiasm as I can muster in supporting the teams at, at, at Berkeley uh, and in helping to support the general program in athletics as well. I don't want to put you on the spot, Professor Dirks, but we're going to need to hear a Go Bears. Go Bears. Not bad for a first time out. We'll work on it, but not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank you for your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. I know that people who've, who are watching this, who've watched this, are going to feel that same sense of excitement that I have right now about what lies ahead for the campus and also a deep sense that we're gonna be in really good hands. So thank you, and we look forward to your arrival on campus. Thank you, Dan. This has been a great conversation for me and just the beginning of many, many wonderful conversations I look forward to. I am so excited to be joining you at the University of California at Berkeley. Thanks so much.